Hello, 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 uh, everyone. Um, this is the introduction to the Agile TOC method, the ATM. And I am Clark Ching, the newly named bottleneck detective. Um, you may know me as the bottleneck guy, but um, for reasons that will become obvious when you see this, um, I'm just going through a, a temporary rebranding. Uh, so I'm now the bottleneck detective and I'm going to start off just, just soon. Um, I suppose this is in a way it's an advert, um, but it's just more like a, a heads up um, that I'll be coming out with a, a relatively cheap, quick kind of appetizer course um, for learning about bottleneck management, not ATM stuff specifically, um, but I'm just putting that course together at the moment. It'll help you find bottlenecks out there in the wild. And now, if you can, can I get you to grab your phone, put the camera on if you are um, if you are ready, uh, and maybe take a picture um, of that QR code, and so that you can get the picture that's beside it. Um, it'll open up a little website, and it's just got that picture, just in case you want to refer to it, because the, the, that model will disappear um, sometime. So I'll just give you a moment to do that. If you're wondering what I use there, there's this cool little app that's available on uh, the Mac and iPad and iPhone called Craft. Uh, and it's got this nice little feature that you can actually just share pages, and they end up looking vaguely respectable. Okay, right. So there, if you hadn't Yes, that's the ATM model. Now, there's, I think the last time I counted it, there were 49 words on that page, and I paid $10,000 uh, to get uh, some training, coaching, mentoring uh, from a, a company that sort of specializes in this stuff to help me uh, distill my life's work uh, down to 49 words, roughly. So each word on there costs um cost me approximately two hundred dollars so i hope you en en enjoy this uh because as you know um i've written you know thousands of words worth of books and and i kind of I, I i realized a wee while ago that there was so much detail and so much um stuff in this i needed a way to kind of have a, a little model or a framework that that summed everything up and and the reason that there, there was a, this thing about five or six years ago where i was um no, it's longer than that, seven or eight, nine years ago. And the company that I was working with at the time, uh, one of the program managers showed me a picture of the SAFE model. Uh, if you're not familiar with Agile stuff, it's like a big model that shows uh, all of this Agile stuff from, you know, um, but not the nitty gritty team level. The team level stuff is just a few little boxes at the bottom. It's all this big, chunky stuff. And, and I looked at it um, and I go, oh, we're already doing all of that. Uh, but the guy said, no, no, we need to do all of this. I mean, we're already doing all this. Um, but he, he loved the diagram and the, 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 the one pager um, made him feel very, very comfortable with safe as a, as a thing. Um, and so I have over the last two or three years put together this model because I, I think it just kind of um, takes all the words I put together and, and it just um, gives a framework that everyone can chase. So what I'm going to do in this is I'm going to run through the whole model, uh, but I'm going to go deep on, deeper on some bits. And then over time, I'll go deeper and, and deeper and I'll share more about it. So my goal here is to give you enough information to get the big picture um, and then over time, fill in the gaps. And I'll give you as much as you can. There's no sales pitch at the end of it. Uh, there's just um, just as much information as I can give you without uh, making your head, head explode. So now I, I just want to mention safe just for a moment, OK? Um, so you know uh, the ATM is a money machine. So the Agile TOC method, um, ATM, it's like a money machine. And I chose that name specifically uh, because um, people reacted to safe. Um, people whose jobs was to, they felt almost was to protect uh, their workplace from the crazy lunatic agile people. They really loved safe because it gave them all the governments and stuff around them. And there was something about having that word safe that actually made it feel safe. And there's a picture of a safe there, you know, inside a bank. Well, the ATM, it, it works over top of all of the agile stuff. Um, there's nothing prescriptive about um, what agile method you use. In fact, you don't even have to use agile. You can um, be a little bit agile and get a lot of benefit from it. But it, it's about um, not the middle management view of this, but it's that level above it, above it where um, if the people who are interested uh, in safe because they like that 
that it, it feels safe and disciplined um, and so on. This is pitched at their bosses, uh, the people um, who go, oh, we're doing all of this uh, really fancy modern software development stuff. So we want to get the, the value out of it. We want to get money out of it because ATM um, to them is a, a money machine. But I really want to point out that that's only one of the three outcomes that the ATM model is trying to get to. So you see snowballing profits in the middle there. Um, snowballing profits is just one of them. Um, that one there is really important. If you have a business that's not actually making money, it's not a very nice place to work. Um, but what I'm chasing also over and above that is three things. And I'll come back to these. One is a, a sense of a productive buzz about the workplace uh, and the other is a collective calm and, and the calm is in a way it's it's not um safe with governance and rules and stuff it's just like people feel safe um and calm because they um the, the jobs aren't at risk there's not a lot of um change going all the time they can just sit down and, and just do their work uh and get on with things and everyone's happy and at the core of all of this um what i'm aiming for right at the center of this heart that you see around here is to have what I call a thriving workplace. Now, if you're familiar with TOC, Theory Constraints, uh, you'll know that Ellie Goldratt called his most successful book, The Goal. And he said that businesses, their goal uh, is to make money. Um, I think most workplaces, uh, well, all workplaces are made up of people. And while the business uh, may have a goal of making money or snowballing profits, um, businesses are made up of people. So I'm aiming for a thriving workplace. And all of the pieces around this model uh, will, will help you get that. And all of them build on, all of them build on top of Agile as it's existing. And so um, there's nothing that really contradicts. Uh, I see yeah, someone here working in government. Um, uh, we, we could come back to that a little bit in, in, in another time. If you wanted to replace profits with um, uh, snowballing customer service or um, serving more uh, hospital patients, you, you can just sub in uh, as appropriate. So now, Okay, so remember here, everything is building on top of Agile. It's taking the Agile stuff and it's taking the TOC stuff and it's kind of doing a Venn diagram where they come together and it's producing a whole lot of stuff. But my starting point here uh, is, is Agile teams. And, and I want to put this like in a little bit of a historical context. And you've probably all heard, I imagine, of the forming, storming, norming and performing model um, from... Sorry, by the way, I noticed I'm just looking at the far right of my screen all the time. So I've just moved that there. So uh, it's less, it's more polite. There we go. So forming, storming, norming, and performing. It comes from a guy called Bruce Tuckman. Um, uh, and it's a model that has been used for years and years and years uh, to describe what it's like when people join a team. Um, uh, and, you know, you get someone, the team forms, um, and then they go through a storming kind of phase where they argue a bit and try and find their relative positions to each other in hierarchy and pecking order, and they um, uh, disagree. And then eventually they go along, and once they've gone past storming, they go to norming, uh, things sort of settle down. And then over time, um, provided they don't have big changes or upsets to the team, they start actually performing. So I've got a, um, a similar model here, and I've just nicked the names um, because they, they seem so appropriate. And I think most agile teams um, uh, or most agile transformations have gone through the same thing. So if we start here at this angle, um, if, if we start with the, the forming stage um, of an agile uh, transition, this you maybe go back um, five years for some of you, maybe go back 10, 15, 20 years. You've usually got little pockets of people who are trying to do agile in a um, in almost a guerrilla fashion because they can't get by and it's too different. It scares people. Uh, this is kind of, I started in, in Agile in the, you know, 20 years ago now. And this was about, it was like everyone was trying to do Agile despite everyone else. And it wasn't a very easy place to, to work. It was, a, you know, it was genuinely a real struggle um, because the organizations tended to reject it. 
Um, and even if you got it established in a team, other teams weren't doing it. But then over time, what's happened is as Agile has become more um, credible, uh, it's, you know, become more popular. It's almost become like for a lot of businesses, if you're not doing it, or oh, how embarrassing, we can't recruit people. Um, what, what, what's happened is that people have actually made a choice. Um, and they've got over the fear of doing this new stuff um, or, or, or their ignorance of not knowing how. And they've figured out how to move to the next stage, which is usually where they do something um, at a at a bigger level. And it comes from the top down um, or, or the middle out. And it says, um, hey, uh, we're going to start doing agile seriously now. So what happens in this stage nowadays is people get coaches in, uh, they get consultants, they um, send people on courses and they go away and then they learn all of this stuff, get the stuff in their head. And then they go through a storming phase, um, which is where they have all of these uh, conflicts, co conflicts between people, arguments, disagreements, as they're all trying to figure out how to make this weird way of working work in their new world. And, and, and that's just the process that you've got to go through um, to adopt something that seems really, really, really um, new. And, and it takes time and it's not always pleasant. For some people, it's great fun. Um, for a lot of people, there's a lot of change uh, and, and it can be very, very loud um, like cheerleading change or can be change that overwhelms um, people and it turns them off agile. For others, it can be great fun, um, but you go through this storming phase. And then over time, as you polish off the rough spots, um, you keep uh, turning over um, and then eventually you get to a norming phase. We just go, hey, look, we're doing agile now. It's cool. We're doing agile. So we've got this stuff in. It's kind of working. Um, most of our teams are doing it. Not everything's straight um, forward. Sometimes we have, uh, you know, exceptions where it's difficult. But, you know, we're more or less, um, we're now living in the agile world and 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 we've got enough people there, enough um, momentum behind it that it's kind of sticking. You know what? And it's actually quite working. We're now producing better products, which is brilliant. Um, our users, our, uh, uh, our, our, our people are collaborating. Um, that's that, that, that's really cool. Um, uh, before that, they were little, uh, you know, testers were over there and uh, developers are over there and they never spoke to each other. Now they chat and they work as a team. You've got people in there. Everyone's going, hey, this agile thing works. And, and over time, ideally, it would just become just this is the way we do things here. But what I have, have noticed, and I'm not the only one, but um, uh, a lot of people have got a frustration with the state of Agile it is. It kind of feels like, um, if you remember that, uh, I've forgotten his name, uh, As Good As It Gets, the movie. Um, as, there's that movie, As Good As It Gets, that uh, Jack Nicholson says, look, you know, is this as good as it gets? Uh, and for a lot of people, um, it is as good as it gets. And it's a lot better than what it used to be. Um, but the, the question um at this stage for me is and it's a choice actually is to decide is this is, is this actually good enough um because what you get a lot of the times at this stage is you get agile teams who have become very well functioning um and they collaborate within the team but they're not doing so much um to collaborate with their uh customers their, their um, executives they've got um ceo of the company's going oh, i spent all this money transforming these teams and they seem sluggish uh they seem sluggish i thought they were going to get faster and besides all of my competitors are they're all doing agile so there's no competitive advantages and i want this stuff on time and um and 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 but the teams um they won't uh they say they don't do projects uh the, the middle management layer um has kind of been neutered uh a lot and they feel that they can't actually change the organization because the team has a lot of power power that they've earned and power that they deserved but they're not collaborating very well beyond the team so this is not to say that the norming stage is bad um it's just often people mistake the busyness uh, and the joy of collaborating together um, and think they're finished, um, but they haven't. And, and that's the stuff that um, I'm going to talk about a bit more. Um, so if you decide it's not good enough, there's a level beyond this where you get to what I've, thanks to Bruce Tuckman, called the performing stage. And this is where you really start to, 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 to roar, uh, to, to fly, um, but you're probably reframed what you're chasing. And those are the things that you'll see in the ATM model. You're chasing the snowballing profits, um, the, the, the buzzing productivity, um, and also the calmness. A lot of the things that are missing, uh, missing. And you're trying to replace the busyness that you often see in norming teams. Um, 
and uh, you, you're trying to replace it with a, a focus on um, creating a thriving, a commercially thriving workplace that's good for everyone. Okay, I've just noticed Jacob's, um, I will try and come back to that. Uh, adjourning sounds uh, quite good, um, but uh, I will lose my flow if I don't move to the next slide, which um, looks like this. So now, remember here, I'm not saying bad things about Agile, but I think if you look at it from most points of view, it's just, just, just to clarify, that, I've been doing Agile, um, to, to clarify that, I've been doing Agile for, for 20 years now, um, and I absolutely love it. I just feel disappointed because I think too many people are stuck in that. Um, it's good enough, um, but they haven't gone over, made that second choice where it's, um, it's better. And I think a lot of the, the thing that they're doing is they're focusing on being and doing agile or they're debating whether they're being agile or doing agile when probably they're doing it both and and you see the little iceberg shape here um we've got this like shallow view of agile that we're focusing on this and it's very much focused on the inside of the bank you know like safers it's got a safe inside the bank it's focused on the inside um and you'll get lots of stuff going on there it's really quite exciting you know a lot of us over the years have earned our income um doing all this stuff like coaching um we'll have summits and we have conferences loads and loads of techniques and debates about those there's a lot of new roles new rules last year's new roles and new rules will get replaced with um newer roles and newer rules uh and it's just all of this activity going on that's focused on being and doing agile now, now, I think that's quite shallow. I mean, it, it, it's useful, it's important, but there's a depth um, below that that's even more important, which is what are we trying to achieve out of this? And I've mentioned the three things. There's a productive buzz, a collective calm, and snowballing profits. So I think those top, the top and the bottom one, productive buzz and snowballing profits, probably makes sense because they're, you know, like logistical or financial, you can measure those. Um, that, but the collective calm, I think, is, I think it's actually hugely important because the level of calmness that you get in your work environment is relative um, to a whole lot of stuff that's going on. And if it's not calm, um, often it's not productive. Um, and often it's not making much money. And, and I'd like to give you a little analogy here. Um, it, 40 years ago, roughly 40 years ago, um, living here in Nelson, New Zealand, um, my mum and dad took us to visit a friend of my dad's. Um, and they lived way, way, way over that way where they still can't get even 3G Wi-Fi signal. They had a big farm out in the middle of nowhere. And the kids, to be honest, they were just about the same age as me um, and a bit older than my younger brother who was with us at the time. And uh, they were quite feral. Um, and, and the parents, I think, were delighted to have two other kids. And they said, right, take the, 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 these two boys um, for a walk around the farm. So we got sent off on a walk around the farm. And as we wandered around having, um, you know, a look on this in this um, uh, 1970s, 80s kind of uh, farm, we came across an old wooden um, shearing shed. And on the outside, the kids pointed it out. They said, look, over there, there's a beehive. And you can see bees flying in and out of it. And so uh, the, the kids said, look, we'll throw stones at it. It'll be great fun. Um, and my brother and I, not knowing any better, go, hey, yeah, this will be great fun. We started throwing stones uh, at the beehive. And, and as you can imagine the perspective of the bees at the stage. Right? They had been productively buzzing um, around the place uh, and they hadn't been making money. They'd been making honey and they'd be busy doing this and everything was going good. Then suddenly there's these rocks flying at them uh, and their calmness disappeared because they felt threatened. Uh, and they felt scared. Uh, and so they went from being productive um, to being defensive. And they came out and they chased after us and they stung my brother. And my mother had to drive about 90 minutes to the nearest doctor um, uh, and drop him off. And that's how we discovered he's allergic to bee stings. Um, so uh, calmness, I think, when you walk back in the workplace, uh, when you don't have calmness, it's actually really, really horrible. And you don't have productivity and you don't have um, profits. And those things all kind of mesh together. And they give you the thing that I'm trying to chase with ATM. And it's not like in the goal, which was to make money now in the future. It's something that suits 
all um, everyone. And it, it's really kind of straightforward when you see it. And I, I almost go dull when I point it out. But it, it took me um, 25 years to, to figure this out. But what it comes down to is the ATM, I believe that everyone who works hard to adopt Agile actually just simply deserves to work in a thriving workplace. And that's the little model that's come up there. Um, it's called the Thrive Model. And if I was Twee, I would tell my little story and call it the Hive Model um, for the Beehive and then put a T in front of it and chase, change the money to honey. Um, but I'm not going to be Twee. I'm just going to tell you I'm not going to do that. Um, but this is what we've got to, the, the, the thriving workplace. So if you take that model there, which has gone from the shallow but really important practical level of doing and being agile to the three outcomes um, and then the thriving workplace, which is our is our overarching goal, um, we end up with that. And keeping in mind that, yes, it is ATM, but it's not all about making money. That's just um, one of the things, one of the outcomes. Right. So. I'm now going to unpack this, and, and I know there's a lot of uh, detail um, coming through here, and there's a lot of stuff, but over time, if you're interested, I'll dig into these areas, so don't feel like you have to memorize or understand everything here. Um, I'll do my best. I'm not going to cover every point, um, but I'm going to cover the stuff that's probably the, the, probably the most immediately useful um, or um, surprising for you. So there's the heart of the thrive, uh, of the uh, thrive model there. Um, we've got those three things here and I'm going to fill out around the edges. So we have turbocharged delivery. Now, can I just show you, you, you might notice here that I quite like playing with words and, and that's how I end up um, coming up with a lot of my best work. Um, and so if you look at this, notice T-O-C, hidden and turbocharged. Um, so this is where, at this level, we take the Agile teams, which are um, nice flow models, uh, so flow, flowing systems that, that are very similar to a manufacturing process, uh, and we take those, um, those teams uh, and we shove on some um, heavy thinking um, from the TOC world. And I'll go through each of those, um, but I just want to talk about this other one, potent projects first. Hang on, no, actually, let me go back a step and let me just put that guy back in there. The, the turbocharge thing, um, if you imagine you've got a car and you add a turbocharger on it, it will go faster. Um, there's another thing that goes um, beyond that is to make sure it goes in the right direction, of course. Um, going faster in the wrong direction is stupid. And that's a big part of this. But if you look at what you get out of that, if you can go faster in the right direction, presumably your profits will go up because you'll be um, shipping more, you'll be um, uh, also more productive. So that's what we get out of adding the TOC. We get the, the profit uh, uh, and the productivity. When we go to the next level, um, we're doing projects. Now, one of the things that, in fact, one of my really good friends uh, is into the no projects um, uh, movement uh, in, in Agile. And uh, I think projects are wonderful, provided you only do them on important projects uh, where um, you actually want to make sure stuff gets delivered on time. So uh, my friend has actually written a book about it. And I always feel a little bit awkward talking about this because I go, yes, projects, um, but make sure you do them at the right time um, in the right place uh, and don't do them for everything, um, for goodness sake. Uh, but now the, the reason um, why projects are so important the, the first thing is they actually constrain the size of an effort, that they give this high level constraint uh, that then says solve within this budget or within this time frame, And that, that's really powerful. Uh, but the, the, the thing that's most important is that it, it's, it's called the, the time value of money. Um, it, what, what it says is that if I'm doing something, uh, I'm building a brand new product and it needs to go live um, in November so that I get the Christmas rush, then it's really important that it goes live in November or early December uh, rather than January or February because you can spend a huge amount of money on it and uh, you could end up not making very much money back because you miss that, that moment. You could also 
um, as you'll see as I come up later, you could also, without a project framework around it, uh, end up um, building much bigger projects than you need to um, and fewer of them. So if you want to make money, there's a huge, huge, huge value in delivering stuff quickly uh, and not delivering too much stuff and often delivering stuff on time. Now, I noticed, Malcolm, you put a, a move, a notice here that there's a move from projects to products um, approach. I, I th There is a move, and that's kind of what frustrates me is because they don't conflict. Um, if you have a project and the date is really important, there's, there's no conflict. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really easy to do both, but you don't want to do projects all the time, uh, and you don't want to create false dichotomies. Okay, so the, the, the potent projects um, gives you more money. Um, if you use it on projects where um, you want, where, where time is really important and you will make a lot more money uh, if you deliver something this year rather than next year, um, that's hugely, hugely important. Um, the collective calm now. I have been made redundant three times in my uh, lifetime, uh, lost my uh, job three times and twice. It was because um, of projects that ran way, way, way late um, and the business suffered really, really, really badly. And that created a really uncalm work environment that was just horrible and unpleasant. There was a thrashing at the end of these big projects um, that just it just was really, really stressful. People lost their jobs. They couldn't pay their mortgages. Um, there was people, there was infighting. They couldn't recruit new people because of the, the caustic nature of where, um, what, the, what the place was like. Uh, and and I actually, there was a company in Edinburgh where I used to work. They um, built a component that got into one of the early iPhones. And then for the next release of the iPhone, they were three weeks late on their project to produce the component for the cutoff for Apple to put it in their next iPhone, whatever. Uh, and two years later, um, that pro that company had gone from soaring financially and been a huge success to being bought out by a competitor. Um, so the, the project thing, delivering stuff sometimes on time um, is really important. And if you do that, it can be nice and productive. You can make money um, and it calm and it will be nice and calm. But if you don't, often you can have a very unpleasant work environment um, because you're running late or you're, you, you know, you're just not making as much money. Now, I'm over talking that one there at this stage of it. So I want to move to the next one, which is quiet change. Now, a lot of the one of the lessons that we got from the theory of constraints is that not all change results in improvements. So what you want to switch to is you want to use the tools in the theory of constraints. Um, it might be bottleneck management. Uh, it might be uh, just the, the thinking process tools to focus in and have um, not a shotgun, scattergun, uh, you know, loud change that's happening everywhere, but really focused change that just tweaks at the right point, makes a tweak, and hardly everyone notices, um, and things get better. Uh, now, I'm not going to go deeply into this one as, as we go on to it, uh, mostly because I think this is kind of like my secret sauce, and I'd love to share it, but I don't understand the nitty gritty of it enough to, to, to share it in, in public yet. Um, the, the other ones are much more simple to explain. They're much more you know, logistical. Um, there's a lot more art in the quiet change. But um, if you've ever worked on a, and uh, you know, someone comes on, goes, oh, we're going to have another transformation, guys. Um, and everyone goes, oh, because just they just feel overwhelmed. They just know there's going to be all of this change coming up and it's going to be unpleasant and awful. Uh, and going back to um, government departments, when I first got back to New Zealand five and a half years ago, I worked for one of the government departments and I was brought in, I think it was technically as um agile enterprise coach or, or something like that but in the hr system they put me in as change manager um and then someone saw that and they went into a panic because they thought when i was um, having meetings with them that the change manager was going to come and lay them off um you know basically they were coming in to do the the, the dirty work of change so uh, a big 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 part of this is if you look at the turbocharged delivery and the potent projects the stuff that comes off them is quite logistical left brain sensible stuff but it requires change to get there um and you'll see that there are three things coming up that that fit around um so i'm just gonna race through to them 
um, and, and I'll just talk through each of them. And I'm going to spend a bit more time on the blue and the green stuff, but I won't go into um, any detail in the quiet change apart from just a moment. So with the turbocharged stuff, we we um, we don't just put the bottleneck um, management stuff in that you could read about in the goal. We actually make sure the bottleneck is in the right place. Actually, I just noticed um, Grant said noticed that I use stories uh, to change minds uh, gently. That's actually part of the quiet change thing. L learning to tell stories is, is, is really, really hugely helpful um, and, and, and quite an art, um, but far easier to learn than you might think. So um, going back, right place the bottleneck here. Um, it, it, we, we, there are many places, every, every system will have a bottleneck. Um, there are good places to have a bottleneck and there are really bad places. And I'm going to come back to this one and go into it a bit more detail. Um, but if you have found your bottleneck and you put it in the wrong place, it can be very, very, very unprofitable. And we want to make sure that the bottleneck's in the right place. Um, curate the cache. Now this, if you could all just memorize one word from this, curate. If you think of a, a, um, a museum, a museum has all of the stuff that they could put out uh, on their museum floor. Uh, but they have this limited space, so they have a curator, and the person decides very carefully what to put um, out on their precious uh, floor space. And it's the same with our systems. We have to very, very carefully curate what comes in to our agile um, development systems um, for, for a bunch of reasons. And I'm going to come back to this on one of them, but um, uh, I won't go into detail into this, but I want to give you a, a hint of it, is that most systems that you build, not all, um, you, if you're building an operational system, quite often you will have a bottleneck inside the operational system that you're building. So when you're curating the work that you do, it's really helpful if you actually target your bottleneck. So curation um, needs to take into account where your bottleneck is inside your development system, as well as um, inside the product or the system that you are building or fixing or improving. Um, and curation is is um, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful process where thinking and conversations can make so much positive difference, so much money. Right. And then the last bit, and I hope I've spelt that correctly, synchronize the system. Um, synchronize the system. Now, one of the things with Agile, if we, we see a lot of stuff about scaling Agile teams. Um, when you scale them, unless they're completely ring-fenced and independent of each other, uh, which they hardly ever are, then they actually have shared components. And often those shared components, uh, they're kind of like the, you know, the the the, the roundabout or the bridge uh, that, um, so I'm thinking of Sydney here, because I know a bunch of you from Sydney, um, you know, the bridge that comes over the harbour, you know, that shared thing where all of the stuff merges in together and they have to cross over the bridge and they create a, a bottleneck. When you go to synchronise um, a more than one agile team, you need to make sure you need to find out uh, where your bottleneck is for the bigger system because you are a, a big team of teams uh, and you will have a shared resource that's often a bottleneck. Right. Now, dollarize the price. I'll come back to this one and invert the pyramid. This is just um, really just classic uh, agile project management. Um, uh, with a twist and stack the deck. I'm not going to go into detail on this one, but you know, when you're playing cards, if you stack the deck, you're, you're cheating. You know, it's kind of like stacking the deck is cheating. If you're in project land or you're doing commercial stuff, if you stack the deck, you're setting stuff up for success at the beginning um, of, of something rather than um, later on. And it's actually a really, really good thing. You're just going, how can we outwit bad things um, early? Uh, by analogy, if you think of a uh, an aeroplane that's coming into land on a runway uh, and it's bad weather, you really hope that the, um, the pilot will land at the beginning of the runway um, so that if anything goes wrong, there's plenty of space to, to recover rather than land at the end. It's the same with, um, in, in TOC, we have this idea of full kitting. Uh, and I won't go into it in details, but there's so much stuff that you can do at the beginning of a project to set it up to fail or succeed. And yet the... In, in, in Agile land, we, we favor um, action and we like to dive into things uh, and we often forego some of those harder conversations that can prevent a lot of um, a, a lot of disasters uh, for the sake of some difficult conversations. So that's stacking the deck and quiet change. Um, pick your battles. Uh, you know, it's um, don't change everything. Um, uh, we're going to win the war. 
um, try and avoid battles altogether. But if you're going to have battles, um, uh, pick them carefully and judiciously and build the trust. If you're changing stuff, you want to do it in a way um, where people don't, don't go, oh, I'm going to lose my job if I talk to that change manager. You want to build trust. If there's anything in the quiet change or is there, there's any one of the outside accelerators in this model that's really underlies everything else, um, it's um, building trust. Because if you don't do that, you're buggered. If you forgive my um, language, your, um, your change initiatives uh, will not work nearly as well as you might hope they will. And then the last bit is, is something I, I got from Ellie Goldratt, um, but I, I don't necessarily, I, I built on it for my way of working. Um, and, and I think you'll, you, you, you will get the idea. If you go um, and, and try and change stuff and you put it in a way that causes people to argue about it, um, then you will spend a lot of time arguing and not a lot of time changing. So, um, building the trust is really important, but just figuring out um, how to cause change in a quiet way, um, drip, 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 um, picking your battles and not getting people to resist and fight the change. Um, it's surprising. Sometimes this is just the, the choice of words that, that we use. Um, but anyway, I'm going to dig down now and I want to show you this one. I think this is so bloody obvious um that you'll probably go oh i knew that and then you go oh no i i didn't um so i'm going to give you a little example um and the choice of the word snowballing is really 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 important here all, all of the words on here are really important um they aren't just um they aren't there by accident they aren't there to make it sound like uh, someone who has a bad marketing degree has uh, written it, um, that snowballing means something very, very specific in this case. And I think that if you were talking to your CEO and you were going, dear CEO, um, uh, I would like to put some, uh, you know, changes in here to the, you know, a few little tweaks to the way we do Agile. Um, this is the pitch that the CEO will like in particular. Um, and when I say pitch, it's just, it's just facts. So I'm just going to show you this here, a little example. Um, so let, just imagine two universes, and we'll call them universe one and universe two. And in universe one, each project takes four months. Okay. Um, and they all happen to be identical. So they look like that. There you go. There's three projects done, each of them taking four months, right? Um, and then in universe two, uh, because they've done some of the stuff in here, m maybe they've got the bottleneck in the right place. And so suddenly they're um, going, uh, it, it takes 25% less time to do each project. Um, or they go 33% faster. Um, and it just looks like that. So there's no magic here. It's just some of those silly little uh, uh, imaginary um, universes here. And let me just show you something. Oh, let me get rid of that. Each project delivers $1 million extra profit, say, a month once it's shipped. Okay. So that means that project one, just it, it, in universe two, project one happens to contribute or make $1 million extra dollars than in universe um, one, even though they were identical, they just happen to be a lot quicker. Okay, so that, that's that's nothing. That's just straightforward. I'm not um, playing any games here. But now there's an interesting thing here, which is if you looked at that, we might call that 1 million there, the cost of delay. But I want to show you something. The cost of delay for project two is $1 million. But it happens to start one month earlier at Universe 2, and it happens to finish one month sooner. So it makes an extra 2 million. And then Project 3, the cost of delay is still 1 million, but it happens to start two months, er, two months earlier, and it finishes in one month less time. So it makes 3 million. And then Project 4 um, is 4 million, and then Project 5, there's 5 million and so on and so on and so on. It, it's snowballing like a snowball that starts out really small at the top of a hill and it rolls and it turns over. And every time it turns over, um, the extra value gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
until it gets so big that it knocks over some kid, absorbs it in the snowball and kills them, which is a little um, twist you weren't expecting. Um, sorry for that. I'll cut that out when I go live because it sounds a bit mean, doesn't it? Um, yeah, Clark encourages killing small children with snowballs. So I like this particular thing here because most of us live inside those projects and most of us go, oh, yeah, the cost of delay. Um, if, if, if in Universe 2, if someone came along and said, oh, look, I want to add this other stuff in here and it will take an extra month, you go, oh, well, OK, we could do that. But will it bring in more than a million dollars? Because that's how much we'll lose by not going live. That's the cost of delay. And when we're inside the project, it looks like that. But when you look up above it and look down at all the projects over a period of time, say from a CEO or a CFO's point of view, you look and go, Wow, that cost of delay um, is actually far, far, far more than that. Far more than that. Okay, I see a lot of chat there. Um, oh, we covered a lot with 11-year-old boys here. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to move on for this. I just want you to think about that one because that is um, for a business that is not is doing okay or is not doing okay, um, being conscious of the snowball effect when you think of that normal curve and that choice too, of, is it good enough? Then if you go, no, uh, the snowball effect means that um, we need to start making some di slightly different decisions, um, then the snowball effect is just hugely important there. Okay, so I, I don't want to dwell on that because it's making me tired thinking about it. Right, now I'm going to go back to right place the bottleneck. And if you want to learn more about bottlenecks, you can look in any of these books, right? You can learn them, you can read the, the goal. Um, this one here, you know, of course, that's the, the classic. That's the, the granddaddy of them all. Wonderful book still. Um, it's set in factory land. Um, and it's got a whole lot of stuff kind of around it that's really, really interesting and fascinating. And you might feel a bit bamboozled uh, as you go through it, but you go, these guys are really clever. Um, always, um, if I were to recommend one book, it would be that. If you're in a hurry and you haven't read it already, The Bottleneck Rules, that's mine. Rolling Rocks Downhill, it covers the bottlenecks, but it, it was it's not really about bottlenecks. That was one of the secondary things on it. And uh, Steve Tendon's um, got some really good stuff about Kanban teams and, and bottlenecks and, and so on. Um, now, none of these, I think, are nearly as important as this little simple uh, example I'm going to show you now. Um, and if you're interested, I'm doing a talk tomorrow night, six o'clock New Zealand time. Look on my LinkedIn thing. And it's about the idea of a flagship um, bottleneck. And it's this same thing, but I'm going to go into it in more detail. Um, and... It involves this thing called a U-shaped timer team. Now, I'm going to draw the U-shape in a moment, and it's nothing to do with sheep. Um, uh, but that's a timer, right? Can you see that little fella there? That's a little one of those um, egg timer things. Um, it's not that kind of timer. It's this kind. All right. See that there? Can you see there the sand dripping through the little hourglass? I think it's the three-minute glass. This is actually there. That's the bottleneck. And for this thing, that's in the right place. And by analogy, when I show you this U-shaped part of the word, um, you'll realize, ah, what Clark is talking about is making sure that there is actually a bottleneck in the middle of this flow system that we call an agile development team or an agile development, whatever we want to call it. And this applies in projects and in product teams. Um, and uh, the important thing is that the bottleneck is deliberately placed in the middle. So let me show you. And I, I think I can oh, I'm gonna make sure I'm pushing the right button. So there's a U shaped. That, that's, see, see the shape of a, a U there. Now, um, no, notice down the bottom here, we are going from left to right. And work just flows through these rows. You've got a customer, a product owner, product manager, product, anything you like to do with product. Um, you, the, the customer here, um, uh, I'm thinking in terms of them being the internal customer, um, the head of marketing, perhaps the sponsor of this, this, this um, business unit or project. Um, the AN is analyst, dev, developers, 
Um, then you've got test and then you've got operations, the people that kind of keep the, everything running and then um, take the changes and pop them out in the real world so people can do them. And um, just as an example of how easy it is for us to, to focus um, in narrowly and not see the big picture, I should also add on here users at the end of it. Now, each of these individual um, roles or types of work, resource types, um, they have uh, they have relative capacity. Um, so what I'm mapping out here, and I want to start with this one because that's where the, the bottleneck should be. Developers should be your bottleneck. This is the takeaway from this bit. Developers should be your bottleneck. And, and what it means is that the people who are upstream, these guys here, should have relatively more capacity than the developers do. So they have a bit of slack and a bit of spare time um, that gives them time to prep stuff and think about things quite thoroughly and maybe and, and, and go through and, and not be rushed. Um, they've got time to do their job so that they can actually feed good quality fuel into the backlog that goes to the developers. So all, all it means is that they just have a bit of spare capacity um, and they don't feel under the pressure to feed stuff and in, stuff into the developers and cut corners. Okay, so that, that's all, all it means. They're not the bottleneck. Um, and on the other side, but for test, for instance, you want test also to have spare capacity so that they can actually be reactive and quick, like a um, like in the pit crew of a um, of a Formula One team. The, the pit crew is sitting there and they're waiting. And, and, and they're not doing anything. Um, and they're just waiting for the car to come back in. And they're all prepped and they're ready to go. And then when the car arrives in, pew, pew, and they, they do this stuff really quickly, and then the car races off again. It's the same with testing. We want them to give very fast feedback. And we don't want them as well to be in a position where they feel like they have to cut corners. Because if they feel like they have to cut corners, um, they won't do their job as well. Um, or alternately, um, this is a uh, what you see a lot is developers will be producing stuff and the testers can't keep up so the developers will start more and more and more stuff and then you end up going there's just the, um, the whip just keeps growing and growing and growing and everything um, keeps everyone busy but it gets very sluggish now so that was the U shape the opposite of the U shape is the N shape I'll call it the end shape. Or if you like, you could call the smiley face, which is good, the U shape, or frown face, um, which is the, the end shape. Now, this is the shape that most teams are in. So, so I'm just, there's nothing really surprising. Uh, so if I just say this about the, the, the green, the U shape, um, it, it's really obvious uh, it, when you think about it, it. Almost all teams are set up on the assumption that developers will get good quality stuff fed to them um, and that they'll get fast feedback from their testers. That, that, that's all it's saying. Um, it sounds mysterious because I'm putting different words and stuff around it, but that, that's all it is. The upstream of the developers, they prepare good quality inputs. Um, downstream, they provide fast feedback and they release stuff um, well and, and, and so on. Um, when you flip it over to the other way, and um, most teams are shaped like this, they're shaped like this nasty red shape. They actually have far too many developers. And I say most teams, I'm not making that up to sell this uh, idea, it's just true, but most teams will fight that um, and disagree with it because they look and they see that their developers are really busy. And the reason that the developers are really busy is usually that the people in this part of the world, upstream of them, are busy trying to keep them busy. They're busy looking at stuff and going, how can I feed stuff? Because we've got um, all these developers and they pass stuff that's either low value and high effort to the developers to keep them busy, or um, they pass stuff that's not ready to the developers. They give it to the developers and then it loops back and it comes back as rework. Yeah, th this is a, a, is a, it's really, really obvious, um, uh, but it's really, really not obvious. Um, so if you just trust me, the bottleneck should be deliberately set up as your developers. And if you are, you'll have very, 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 very fast teams that are heading in the right direction. And if they're not, and most of them aren't, they have far too many developers because people think you get more code written by adding more developers. Um, then um, if you do that, you'll actually have uh, teams which are very, very busy, but they'll be doing rework or busy work. Um, and it's devastating. And the 
frowny face, the upside down one, actually in a way looks more productive um, because everyone's really, 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 really busy. Uh, so most of the work that I do in my consulting and mentoring work seems these days to be flipping teams over, turning that uh, frowning face into a smile, um, if you like. Uh, and, and I'm telling you the answer here, but remember how I was saying that the, 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 the change bit is hard? I would say that for 90% of teams, the change to flip that over is actually quite easy. But for some of them, it gets um, it's really, really, really tricky to do that. Um, and it's counterintuitive. Right. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Uh, sorry, I just got a direct message from Claudia. Enjoy your other meeting. <laughs> um, so um, if I just sum this up, and I know there's a lot to take in here, um, but what you want is that there. You, you want the bottleneck in the middle. That's why it's called a timer team, um, because it looks like an egg timer. And you want the bottleneck to be in the middle. Um, now, this bit here, see all these other roles here? Um, uh, see, see the the bottleneck in that champagne thing is actually at the, the top. Um, you often find that teams that are not U-shaped are actually held down through having roles that I hadn't even put on there. They're not part of the flow system directly. Um, they're the leadership or, you know, like the scrum masters. I've got a scrum master and I'll spread them across five teams. Look how busy they are. And you see all the teams being really, 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 really busy. Um, but the coordination and value that the Scrum Master um, uh, adds, it, no one can see that it's missing because everyone goes, oh, well, they're busy. They must be really productive. And they're not. Um, you could have, say, the CEO. Um, it could be a project manager, a tech lead. It's surprising how often um, teams will run along and the tech le leads are so busy. They're spread across so much stuff. They don't have enough capacity to make sure that the, um, that the developers or, or whichever role they look after is actually nice and productive. Um, so the bottleneck um, is not just one of those ones that we classically um, see there. Okay, right. Now let me click on. And now there's one final little bit. Thank you, Simon. Um, I'll catch up with you later. Uh, it's kind of useful when you do this stuff to talk about having a flagship resource. Thank you, Yusi. Um, flagship resource. Um, rather than a bottleneck. It's the same thing, but um, the flagship in, in, in an armada of ships was the one that had the captain or the admiral on it and the flag um, of the, the, the country that owned it. And as they sailed along, all the other ships um, would sail next to it and they would be able to go faster. Um, otherwise, they'd slow down the, the flagship. Uh, you don't want um, to offend people by calling them a bottleneck. So maybe call them a flagship resource instead. Right. Now I want to move across here and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, but I'm going to give you some reading if you want to. This book is shockingly expensive and as it should be, because it's about um, basically about how to use words and thinking uh, to make bucket loads more money. Uh, and it's called the dollarization principle. So on the, um, th there's a lot of stuff. If you've ever done marketing, they'll talk about sell the benefits, not the features. You know, um, sell the painting that's hanging on the wall, um, not the drill bit that was used to drill the hole that it's um, that it's hanging on. Um, uh, you'll see Alan Weiss, uh, a lot of his work was about value-based. Um, there's a guy called Jonathan Stark who's got some really, really interesting work for um, freelancers uh, who... Um, we'll, we'll talk about this. Focus on the value um, and then solve for that rather than focusing on the actual effort and work involved in it. And I'm just going to say this might sound startling, um, but I swear if you did none of this and um, picked up the ideas and in, in, in dollarizing and every project or every product that you're working on, um, if you either dollarize the price to get the, the two things here, this one. Um, or curate the cash, and you take the ideas of going, what are we chasing? Um, and then make sure you solve for that, um, rather than um, solving for how many features can we deliver? Um, and or how busy can we keep people? Uh, you will make a lot, lot, lot more money, and everything will calm down. So let me give you just an example. And um, th this is th this is if you want to rescue an agile project, um, go along and show them this diagram. 
and just say, right, uh, just imagine I walked into a coffee shop, a Starbucks, um, and I went in and I had an unlimited budget and I just thought, right, I'm going to get the biggest, most beautiful coffee in the world. And there's actually a size here I've not heard of until I started Googling called a Trenta. And it's got more in it than a, than a wine bottle. Um, uh, and there's the Venti, which we've all, all, all probably heard of. Um, when, we, we, when we build software, um, we, we tend, the product teams whose job is to build the best product, um, we tend to look at the, um, the product and try and build the most features. It's just, it's just what we do. We try and build the most features and the best features with the best experience and all of that kind of stuff. And it's kind of like building this coffee um, with, I've seen people, you know, do this. They say, I want two shots of uh, espresso. I want some foamy um, milk. I want some ordinary milk. I want some whipped cream. Uh, in New Zealand, for some reason, people put a chocolate fish um, uh, beside the coffee. Uh, you might have some sprinkles and some hundreds and thousands and some syrups, four different types of syrups. And you can build this thing up and go, wow, this is the biggest coffee. But if you were to do the dollarization of this, it's you're not chasing dollars. You're probably, if it's first thing in the morning, um, chasing caffeine. So if you were really, really, really ruthless about this, you wouldn't try and get that coffee with everything in it you would probably get that coffee, which has the most caffeine in it and a, and a little bit of you know, water and milk and stuff to make it palatable. But most product teams try to build this guy. Even when they're doing good agile product teams, they solve for this, they don't solve for the espresso. So the espresso principle is solve for the espresso. Um, and you do that um, by dollarizing, uh, figuring out what this thing is worth. Um, and if I undo that and that and that and that and that, and I'll go there. Now, we, m m most most product teams they they they're not going to build that. That they instinctively go, no, that's too that's ridiculous. We don't need the chocolate fish. Um, uh, they actually try and build the grande version of it. Now, if you want to make money, you apply the espresso principle, which is the eighty. 20 principle and you look at what you're building and you go um you go what is the espresso what's the bare bones of that so here is a little espresso cup i think it's even starbucks so you look at this and you go i want one or two shots of espresso and then you sit down and you do the most painful thing ever and you ruthlessly um start with that you figure out what the espresso is in your product but then you look at it and you go hmm that um is actually really bitter uh so what you do oh hang on sorry you have to wait for my animation to catch up so what we do instead is i want you to start with that one and then add in a bit of extra stuff to make that the espresso taste palatable and now if you think of the snowball effect if you could do that and just get rid of enough scope that each project went 25%, took 25% of the effort. Um, you'd have lots of kicking and screaming, um, but you would build space to do a third more projects every year. And then you get that snowball effect. So this is the curation um, and it's based on the dollarization principle. And it's based, based on the idea that when we build stuff in Agile, we build it up incrementally and we get to employ this wonderful concept called the inverted pyramid, which is, if you're reading along as I'm re-releasing these things, the inverted pyramid is kind of like the big aha moment in the middle of the book. So if you don't want a spoiler, uh, well, don't worry about it, you'll be fine. Um, so the inverted pyramid is how um, journalists write newspaper articles they know that when the thing um especially in, in the old days um they know that when it's going to be in front of a, uh, the old days 20 years ago when newspapers came out um and most people read them on paper they know that they've got so much room in it um that but they don't know exactly how many column inches they're going to get so what they do is they write the lead paragraph 
this is one of the cleverest ideas and it's this is how to do agile projects you know 101 you write the lead paragraph and that effectively becomes what your espresso is and the lead is if you read that top paragraph you go i don't know to need to read anymore unless you're really interested and then they have the important details just like on the screen here and then they add other stuff below and that gives huge flexibility for when that article, they're going to put it in and then they go, oh, we need to chop it down. So they just chop it wherever. And so long as they've got that first paragraph and ideally maybe the second one, um, then they've got the essence of the story there. And that is the, the inverted pyramid is, is, is essentially the project management mechanism that comes with Agile for free. And it works on product teams or teams that are just set up to do projects. Works on both. And you might even know that is um, variable scope, fixed state kind of arrangements, but it, it's far more elegant than that makes it sound. So if you look at what we've got here so far, you've got right place the bottom. This is all of the, um, the, 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 the obvious kind of stuff um, on here. The other stuff that's on here is a bit more nuanced, but we've got right place the bottleneck. Now get the bottleneck in the right place. Yeah, okay, get it in the right place and it will not only go faster, but it'll go faster in the right direction. And that 90% of teams can just do that by going, oh, um, oh, uh, we, we've got too many developers. Let's get them doing some testing. Or um, And why don't we get them seeing if they can help the analysts work with the customer um, and take offloads some work from the customer so the customer can has a bit more time to do the strategic stuff. Simple as that. Um, other times, it's much harder than that. Um, but most 90% of um, teams, are, it, it's, it's relatively easy once they get the idea. And, and it's the sort of thing that can take two or three weeks often and, and suddenly performance skyrockets. Um, then we've got the, the stuff around deciding not how the team is working or how it's structured or where its bottleneck is, um, but we've got the dollarization and the curation, which is about what we work on and feed through. And I swear every big project I've worked in um, has changed after we've had the dollarization discussion. And when I say change, they've made bucket loads more money and they've calmed down and they've hit their previously aggressive dates. Uh, if you don't have the dollarization, if you don't know what, if you don't know you're chasing espresso, um, you'll spend a lot of money on really unhealthy, great big um, cups of coffee. Right. And the inverted pyramid is the mechanism. Ah, Seraphim, dollarization, sorry, I never explained it. Um, dollarization is to look at what you're doing, uh, look at the outcomes that you're trying to achieve, and then put dollar signs next to them. Uh, so it might be, for instance, I'm going to produce this new product. Actually, I remember when I first did this about, um, it was before Agile, actually. I remember I was just coming into it, and I, I remember this project I was working on. It was actually the basis of this, and I asked the sponsor of the project, um, what, how much, what, what, how's this thing going to make money? What, was it, what would it cost if it was delayed by a, a month? And he goes, oh, uh, we reckon it's going to make 20 million pounds a year. And uh, if it was delayed a month, I suppose about one and a half million pounds. And I go, does anyone else know that in the project? He goes, nope, nope, just me. Um, and it was a starting point of, of, of this book. I, I've had other ones. Um, there was there was one where they, I swear I'm not making up these numbers. Uh, it was in the the UK. I got brought in to kind of rescue this agile project that hadn't even started yet, and we tracked it. And the we were the vendor of a product that was being sold to a big big bank, um, and the, they were paying the vendor, my client. It was about a million, a million and a half pounds. And they were trying, they got a new project manager, program manager for this. And the program manager started trying to negotiate that million and a half down by 20%. He wanted to come in, save the bank, uh, two or 300,000 pounds. And then we had the dollarization, which was in pounds, of course, um, the dollarization discussion. Oh, how much is this thing? You know, while we're busy debating all this stuff, how much is this, you know, going to 
how much would it cost you if, if this project is a month later? And we ran through the calculations and it was um, going to basically give the equivalent of, of half a percent to one percent extra um, percentage points of profit uh, per mortgage customer. And they had several million mortgage customers um, who were all paying a lot of money. So we worked out that it was worth between one million and 10 million, which is a big range. But it was also um, an interesting number to play with. One million and ten million pounds a week, and we were delaying the project, debating over two or three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so that's dollarization. Um, when you suddenly get that focus, this, the, the, all the decisions you make um, are very, very different, including um, not building big cups of coffee. Okay, right, so I will carry on here. And the inverted, by the way, the big cups of coffee, th this stuff down here, that, that, that's where all that fluff and stuff lives. Um, that is the espresso, uh, and that, the important details that go around it, is the stuff that makes the espresso taste palatable. Right. So that, I'm not sure why that slides there. I didn't think it was. I thought I had hidden that. So that, that's basically um, that, that. That's basically the the essence of this um, ATM model. And notice that I've not covered the quiet change stuff. I will over time, um, but I've got this weird imposter syndrome going in there. In that it's what I do in my day job, and, and I can't. I think I'm kind of a bit like a maybe a really good rugby player who's not quite at that professional level of, of quite understanding how it all works together. But it's all around influence, picking the battle, using all the theory constraints tools to pick your battles. Um, uh, I don't know if I have it here. Can't, ah, the ideas in this book, The Trusted Advisor. Uh, wow, that's that's extraordinary. If you want quiet change, um, that that's extraordinary. Uh, and if I could get you to read just one book, it's going to blow your mind, this one. I promise this one here. Um, it's actually bizarrely where I got um, much of my ideas about this from. It's a marketing book called Made to Stick. And it's by Chris uh, Chip and Dan Heath. If you happen to get that book, you'll discover um, that much of the material that really good marketers use um, to simplify their products is, is actually built into this. That's where I learned about the inverted pyramid. Um, and I call it dollarize the prize. They call it, um, describe it as commander's intent. And this one, um, I, I just happened to be very lucky and got a gallery copy of it. So uh, I got one from Ellie Goldratt and one from these guys and they're my two favorite books. So there you go. Right, now I'm going to see what comes next, because this will surprise all of us. Ah, yeah, okay, so I just want to come back to this, and I, I, I j just, th th this is kind of the, the point of it, is that most agile teams are doing really, really well. You know, they've gone through these stages, they've got it up and running, they're working hard, having all those great, but kind of shallow, but really important at the same time, discussions about being agile and doing agile. Do we do projects or do we do um, uh, uh, products or, or can we do um, all of the things that we're, we're doing? Uh, do we get coaches? Do we call them um, scrum masters or scrum mistresses or flow masters or uh, I don't know, it gets too confusing. Um, and all of that stuff at the ground level is really important. But when you lift, when you go down in that, that um, iceberg down to those lower levels, um, I, I think there's a, a, a bit missing and a lot of people mistake the effort that they're putting in and the busyness and the hard work and, and all of that stuff. Um, and I don't think that they have, and I think they could do better if they made a choice um, to try and tackle a couple of things that are um, particularly difficult. And one is um, that they're chasing the, the, the product, so chasing the espresso. That's huge. And, and there's another bit that's not obvious from this, 
but the bit that links the products, uh, sorry, the projects and the turbocharged delivery is making sure that you get your customer engaged. And if you would have no more discussions um, about doing or being agile, or whether Scrum or Kanban or, or whatever, and you actually went and spoke to your customer, you would find that your projects would be far, far, far more um, faster. They'd be going in the right direction because you get that input right at the start um, and you would make a lot more money and everything would calm down and you'd have just this lovely workplace that had a delightful, productive buzz about it. And, and I think a lot of people are stuck in the mode where they're going through and having lots of big change um, which is the alternative, which is not calming. Um, they're not doing projects, which uh, sort of separates them, um, sort of creates a big silo with a big chasm between the, the, the business and the IT. Um, and they're not having those hard discussions to chat and, and get together. And I think I should stop talking and start listening, practice what I preach. Hang on. Yeah, that's basically it. Would anyone... I'd like to ask a question, or is there anything that's come up earlier that I didn't see as it scrolled by? Feel free to come off mic if you if you want to. No, we're all good. Carl. Yes. <clears throat> um, what about the government context? You know, where you know you've got X scope that has to meet a certain deadline due to legislation. Okay, right. Um, really, really, really good question. I have deliberately, for my own sanity, put dollar signs on this because it's it's a diff different to change. Changing government is, is harder than changing commercial. Um, so, um, and there are reasons for that. But that said, if you are saying that the... So if you take that example where you go, the scope has got to meet this stuff, that this legislation by these dates. Um, that is probably your espresso. Mm. There's probably other stuff that goes on all around this that is actually adding the chocolate fish um, and the, the syrup into it. Um, and, and I can give you, I think by your accent, we're in the same country, aren't uh, Yes. Yes. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I couldn't hear an accent is what I was meaning. Um, <laughs> so I, I'll give you an example where all of this stuff ties together um, because you, you may actually be saying that that's our fixed scope. In fact, I'll give you two examples. There's one, um, which was maybe seven or eight years ago. It was a big project, maybe a hundred IT people working on it and maybe about 50, 60, 80 business people um, working on it to build a new uh, automatic enrollment pension system in the UK. Uh, and they looked at it and they said, here's our fixed scope. Um, this is absolutely everything that we must do uh, to meet the requirements of the government um, to, to do this, to satisfy this, to better offer this thing. And then they said, um, because they were commercial, they said, hmm, why don't we try and make a bucket load of money out of this instead and actually build a really good product that people like and they come to us because everyone else will be building the espresso version which isn't palatable using my language and they did that uh, and then I came in and I helped them tidy up everything else that they were doing so they could actually deliver it on time actually er early um, and they delivered this this project which only probably had about it had the espresso and, and a bit more in it the thing that they didn't do is they didn't have the espresso dollarization conversations at the beginning of the project. They had it halfway through when it was much harder to fix it. Um, so that's the thing there where there was quite a lot of um, fixed scope, but there was so much more that they could chase there. In governments, um, in a government example, uh, I won't say the government department, but it, it's one that's in New Zealand and it was responsible for doing stuff before the end of the financial year. Uh, and I did, I had lunch with the chief policy person um, uh, there and he described how they had been given an agile team. He was their sponsor, their internal customer, and um, the agile team had set up and they were doing really wonderful things. 
except they wouldn't tell them if they were going to deliver before the end of the financial year. And like that would mean that legislation would have to be um, uh, would be they, they couldn't wouldn't be meeting the law. They'd have to um, bump the the, the tax uh, the, the the various changes in another year. Uh, it would that there'd be um, meetings with prime ministers and and things. And the team refused to, and they said, "No, we're agile. We don't do dates." Um, um, which was really unfortunate because he then went and got a project manager, very thick-skinned project manager with big boots. <laughs> sat down and they got dates out of them and the whole relationship soured. If they had actually started with a project manager and a team that said, oh, look, can, can, um, we don't know how to do dates. Uh, and the project manager said, oh, I see your mechanism here, inverted pyramid. Let's find out what the espresso is. Da, 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 da. And, and, and we will we'll set it up like that. They would have actually delivered in much less time. But the whole thing, their productivity was destroyed um, in a way, because the relationship just said, and it just needed a team that could say, oh, you're agile and we can do dates. Um, but it'd be really helpful if we had a project manager to help us with that. So it's a rather, sorry, I'm, I'm reliving um, past glory. <laughs> hope that was useful, but um, it's, it's the same stuff in government, but you might find that it's harder to justify um, adding stuff beyond the espresso. Yeah, another thing I've I've seen is 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 talking to the business and, and talking about what features must be delivered that you just cannot mitigate, and that becomes your espresso. And and that's it. And what you may also find is that when you have a date, there's some stuff that you can do before the end of the financial year, and some that you can do after. Cool. Uh, I see Julia has asked a question. How would you explain the difference between your dollarized espresso approach and the common MVP, so minimum viable product? or even most loved product model. Okay, um, this one, so the difference here is that I'm saying figure out what your espresso is. Um, and if it happens to be that, that the team is already going, hey, look, we're gonna build the product that's gonna um, make the most commercial sense, then that's good. Oftentimes teams are not building that, they're adding stuff on that makes a better product. So they're optimizing for what they believe is the best product, not the best commercial product. Um, and so if I take another government e example um, for that one, Julia, uh, it was a different government department when I first got back to New Zealand. I, I remember there was, um, I, I remember using the, the coffee, uh, you know, going with two cups of coffee and saying, hey, look, I've looked at your team. They're going really slow and you guys don't think you're going to finish everything. Um, I think, and I'm looking at it, it sounds like they're building a big cup of coffee. Uh, and you want them to build a small cup of coffee because you're running out of money. And the, the, the senior civil servant, um, she said, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm convinced they've paired everything back to the bare minimum that they possibly can. And then the next morning I came in uh, and I found her sitting with a cup of coffee and the um, IT director uh, explaining the analogy and saying she'd looked into it and actually no, the teams are building the best products. Um, but they were running out of money and they unfortunately had to um, start building not the best products, but the good enough products. And they had to pair it back. And ideally, they would have had these discussions a year earlier when mm. it was easier to do that. Um, but for, for, for Julia, they were building the, they, they were building products they loved and they were doing a really, really, really brilliant job. Um, but building the best products... Um, meant that they could get, say, four products a year um, uh, if they built the best ones, but they actually really wanted to, um, the, 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 the government department really wanted 20 um, just good enough ones. Just good enough, yeah. Yeah. And it's just that often I see the teams talking about, not, not necessarily where I work currently, but in, in other teams and other organisations where they talk about, oh, yeah, we're only doing the minimum, we're building them, the smallest thing that we can at the moment, but they're they're really not. They haven't they haven't identified what that piece is. Yeah, yeah, and 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 they don't because they're looking at it from a features point of view and, mm, and a, yes. a product. They're not looking at it from the right. the, the, the benefits, and it's horrible. I, I'll just tell you this: this mm. can seem like a heart rending, heart it's a heartbreaking story. When I wrote this book here um there was an extra 25 percent on the end of it and I, I read this um 
and I was building the best book I could. And it took me 10 years to, to write this, to get to this last version that was good enough to publish. And there was one day I was in Edinburgh, I was walking down one of the hills to get to work. And I was just being annoyed because I just read this book about um, the architecture of books and how they have to have four acts and they have these various points, midway at 25 and 50% and so on. And I'm looking at this and going, and I'd laid my book out, but mine actually had five of those. And I thought, that, that guy's written a really good book, but he got it all wrong. And as I walked down the hill, it suddenly occurred to me, I went, oh, I've got it wrong. And I chopped off the last quarter and two months later, I published my book. Um, and, and you go, I, I had to cut, and that sounds so easy, but uh, roll forward um, three or four months later when it's out and I'm talking to uh, someone and, and she says to me, oh, you must be so pleased. And I hear your book's getting all great reviews and stuff. And I go, and I, no, without any thought, I just went, oh, yeah, but I had to cut off the best quarter of the book and no one will ever see that. And, and so it, it's really, really hard to make to, if your job is to build a good product it's really really hard to build one that isn't the best it just is so mm -hmm. counter it might even be logical but it's really 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 hard um yeah. and and so yeah i was going to say some other stuff but i'll tell you um um not when we're on a public call <laughs> okay <laughs> cool. thanks very much thanks. you're welcome thank you julia we got anything uh else coming in here I had a quick question about that bell curve in the background of the slide you're showing right now. Like, what does that curve represent? What is that? Oh, ah, was that seraphim, was it? Yeah, that's ah, seraphim. <laughs> cool. Beautiful sunset there, wherever you were. Uh, cool. Um, <laughs> so what that, that, that just represents uh, a conceptual layer of the population um, of agile, of um, ad, agile adoptions. It, it's it's really it's 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 not scientific, but it's it's just it's just saying that there's some early stage people. Um, there's some people that are, are doing it a bit better, and to do that, they had to make a a, a big choice, um, and, and that's probably the bulk of of places. But then there's some that that keep going and they get good at things. Um, and then they get to the end of it. You could, if you wanted to, you could turn this upside down and turn it into some ladder. Um, you could turn it into a maturity model. Uh, it's just saying that there are different stages and, 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 and just over time. So it's really just to get that, that point that um, hopefully it's to get people go, oh, I wonder if we're good enough. Number of people in, involved over time goes down. Is that what that means? I don't quite understand. Uh, no, it's it's really the. Uh, oh, you're asking me tricky. It's the percentage. Is, is it very very broadly, non scientifically speaking, um, the, the 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 proportion of a population that um, of the world say that's doing agile um, adoption? You'll find that there's a small percentage who are still forming it. Um, there's a oh, much oh, oh, bigger okay. percentage. Okay, I see what are, you're saying storming um they're still in so if you look at all the different phase. people who are trying to do agile then this is a kind of a curve that's showing roughly yeah. approximately non-scientifically how many percentage yep. are you involved in each phase okay got it yep that's, that's it good question okay thanks lovely i have i have come to the official end of this uh the 90 minutes but if you want to keep going um i'm, I'm not going anywhere if, you've, if anyone would like to ask more questions. Uh, hi, Clark, Saurabh this side. Um, I have a question regarding that U-time, uh, U-shaped uh, curve that you shared. Yep. If you could go to that slide. Uh, so cool. Can I ask who's talking because you know, the, the, the grid view I'm is- Saurabh. I'm Saurabh, I'm Saurabh from Brisbane. Ah, lovely. Cool, and I'll just go over here. Sorry, I've got an iPad going on once here. Uh, Hang on, if I do that, the U shape. Yes. And then I'll. So, there we go. Yep. So, if, uh, and if you could click once more so that we can see that inverted. Uh, yep. So, my question is regarding that bottleneck here, right? So, when you say that towards the middle, when, you, when your developers are typically like, you know, under the pump. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they have whole heap of work to do, and 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 uh, on the other hand, your customer uh, is not, you know, um, 
fast enough to give them the feedback or vice versa mm-hmm. in 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 a true uh, agile way of working you actually would have a cross collaborative squad or a team mm-hmm. and they would be actually kind of you know working hand in hand uh, so why do you reckon that in since in these scenarios you'll encounter uh, these bottleneck situations ah okay um it it could be uh, that when you look at a, an agile team they actually that they actually have upstream of the developers it's actually they've sorted it all out it's been really easy they've got a uh, the internal customer um the sponsor the person who prioritizes things uh mm-hmm. and makes the big decisions um plenty of time to work with the team okay that's awesome you might find that also um because they've been doing agile for a while they've now got loads of testing capacity uh they've got really really clever about this they've automated stuff and so they used to only have two testers and they could get by in the old days um, and now that things are sped up, um, they've also got the developers writing tests. So they've got lots of automated tests. So effectively, lots of testing capacity. Um, and you might find the other roles um, before and after in that same position. And so they could, um, if they're set up like that, they may well be in that performing um, uh, phase of the, the, uh, the, the bell curve diagram. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that would be good. But it could also be, um, that they're all just really, really, really busy, uh, and it's hidden from them uh, that they are busy rather than productive. And, and some of the reasons, what well, if you go and look at it, it's hard to find. But actually, there was a, a team I was working with, um, I'm still working with, a, a few weeks ago, we, we started looking at this, and the developers um, working on an old system um, that's been around for a long time, and they said, uh, I, and I was trying to figure out whether they were um, frowny face, you know, um, whether they had too many developers or whether the developers are the bottleneck. And the developers were busy all the time. You go, okay, well, that, that's cool. So it sounds like they're probably, you know, the bottleneck. And then we dig in a little bit more. And then we go, oh, that's interesting. Because um, the guy just sort of said something, uh, the, 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 the leader of the team said, um, quite often, um, just as a passing comment, quite quite often, uh, we 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 don't get enough stuff from our product uh, team. You know, we so we don't get enough fuel passed to us. But we've got tons of stuff, technical debt, all sorts of stuff that we can work on um, to keep us busy. So what you're finding in that place was that um, the developers were busy, um, and they were doing technical debt fix up, which is really really good. But, and I said to him, do you think it would be better if, if the product team upstream, if, if they could actually feed you stuff and you had less time when you had to keep yourself busy, would that be good for everyone? Oh, that'd be brilliant. We've got so many customers out there who are craving, um, you know, the, the development work, but that they not get it because we, we held up. And so mm-hmm. if you look at that team, though, with without the eyes of a bottleneck, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're, they're being a bottleneck there, um, and you look and you go, everyone's busy and, and if everyone's busy that means that they don't um that the developers were, were, in that team were maybe busy say three or four days out of every fortnight so if you could um work with the product team to make sure that they were doing product stuff say five or six days every fortnight that would be a, a, a doubling of capacity but if you looked at them everyone was busy and the, the heuristic we use um as people is are they busy? Yes. Oh, they're productive. Brilliant work. Mm. And it's really hard to untangle. If it was a machine mm. in a factory, you better wander around mm. and look and go, hmm, I see what's going on here because it would all be vis- visible. Um, but to do this, you have to be like that bottleneck detective and go and untangle things and just pick mm. up on little clues and go, ah, oh, so you have downtime. You're only doing three or four days a fortnight worth of actual development mm. stuff and you're keeping yourself busy the rest of the time. And then is, is that bothering anyone? Yes. Okay. Let's do something about it. Hope that helps. It's just really, really so obvious and so counterintuitive at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Good question. Cool. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Clark, could you talk more about curate the cache? Curate the cache. I could. Let me just have a little slurp of this. Your um, headphones, by the way, match the turbocharged delivery um 
just a little blue bit there. Very, very good uh, pre-planning there we did. Curate the cash. Listening to music usually turbocharges my delivery for sure. Excellent. <laughs> it's nice to see you too, by the way. Um, haven't seen you for ages. Um, there's that whole little bit about not going anywhere that makes it difficult to bump into old friends. So curate the cash. Okay, curate the cash. Um so the espresso bit is, is one of it. So, so what you're doing is saying, hey, look, I've got a development team. And, and let's just pretend that they're, they're not, um, just, just for the sake of, just for the moment, let, let's pretend that they are not um, software. That's just a little factory and, and they've got stuff there, right? Um, no, no, let's pretend it's a restaurant and they've got five tables and they've got a waiter that comes out there um, and they've got people in the table. And so for them, curating the cash would be the waiter uh, comes out and tries to upsell um, the dish of the day because that's the one that makes them the most money. Or it might be that they uh, come out um, and they've still got the same capacity going on there and they look and they see a familiar customer who comes in and never orders wine and just behind them is the lush customer that comes in and never orders much food but drinks a lot of wine and makes them a lot, lot, lot more money. And the waiter goes, ah, if I want to earn my, uh, my, um, my, if I want this place to keep open, um, I'm going to uh, prioritize and say, oh, I'm sorry, sir, but that table's booked by that other customer and bring them in. So this, if you imagine at the front of you now switch to um, a factory and now imagine that you've got other products that actually have um, high margins, and for some reason, you come up with a sales pitch that uh, where your customers uh, can sell them. Uh, you'd want them to go out and sell those. So you're effectively curating what comes into your system. Now, imagine you've got something that has got high margins, but also takes a horrendous amount of your factory's bottleneck time. And then you look at it and go, hmm, I've got those other ones that actually have lower margins uh, but they only take 10 minutes on the bottleneck as opposed to three hours. And so you, you switch your sales pitch. You, you effectively curate the stuff um, that you decide to sell. And it's the same with us with a team. You could look at it um, and you, there's, there's a whole lot of stuff behind this. And the, the espresso um, idea is, is just one of them. Um, but you could look and go, oh, um, actually, this is our testers are our bottleneck, but we actually want it to be our developers. Uh, we've got this thing come in and there's two solutions to it. One which requires a little bit of development um, and a lot of testing and the other one, which is the other way around. And then you look and go, oh, um, if I choose one, the bottleneck will stay as it is. But if I choose the other solution, then I'll move the bottleneck around and I'll get it to where I want it to be. So there's a lot of choices there. Um, another one that's really, really, really helpful for people um, is, is if you've got solutions coming in uh, and you've got uh, two options, you, you might just look at it. And, and uh, um, I was talking with one of the people on the call here about this yesterday, uh, ages ago, that there's this team and they um, were, were, were building these features and they all had, it's like you'd ask them for every feature saying, hey, look, I need you to book a hotel. And they'd um, booked you a five-star hotel. Um, and a lot of the time they actually only needed two-star B&B. Um, so again, that's curating the work that comes into the team according to the amount of effort and, and where the bottleneck is. Another one that's really hugely valuable, hugely valuable is um, if you take a stuff that's coming in and you've got your development team here and you've got this stuff and, and, and um, half of it's for marketing, um, uh, and selling the product and half of it is going to um, give you efficiencies and productivity in your call center and you're already the call center's maxed out um, then you might curate it and say we'd be daft wouldn't we to um, try and sell more stuff we'd be better to try and process more stuff because that's where our bottleneck is so it's it's all just making good business decisions um, and the, the bit that's kind of different there's, there's two bits w one is that we we just don't tend to do it um, to, to make those decisions around money. Um, and the other bit is that we don't tend to make the decisions around where the bottlenecks are. And, and we have two bottlenecks at play. One is inside our delivery system doing the software and the other is inside our production system. Um, and we want to make sure 
that we balance things right um, so that we don't, so, so that we improve, so that we don't make the bottleneck situation worse. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it does, I think. Um, if, and, and if you know what the cost of delay is for things that are moving through your system, then you can actually figure out how much of those particular points are cost you by either not addressing them or, or how much this, how much time it's going to take to go through them and make all sorts of interesting economic decisions that you couldn't make before. Yeah, yeah. And it's all about making economic decisions, and but also making it not just in a big a whole system view, but um, not just in the short term. The, the snowball effect you've got to take that out because that's got ramifications for um you know for years ahead and and we tend to focus on the the, the cost of delay of now um so just for example imagine you're working down in, in a project and you go oh look if, if we um keep going we're still going to make a million dollars for this a month um keep going i guess really good keep doing this stuff keep doing it but if there's one just waiting there um and you're going to make two million a month um, then you're going to go, oh, hang on, maybe we should stop this, even though it's still going to give us um, a good return and we should switch to these other projects. Uh, again, this stuff, because it's thinking in terms of quarters and years, um, very few people in the organisation are tasked to do that. Most people are tasked to think in terms of weeks and months. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a whole level a, a above that. Um, but it's amazing what you can do when you start doing it. So is, is a good metric to use like cost of delay per unit of bottleneck capacity or something like that? Um, yeah, you, you, yeah, but it, it kind of gets weird because you get an interaction in your calculate. There's a lot of judgment um, coming to it. And so just do the calculations a good bit, um, but there's lots of scenarios, lots of ways you can slice and dice right. things. And there's an interplay sometimes. It could be, um, yeah, if I did this, um, it could affect the production bottleneck. It, uh, it could boost the, um, the, the the production bottleneck capacity by 20%, which is 20% for our whole system, um, but it's going to take six months to do it. And you go, oh, right. uh, and, and there's a whole lot of, you, you, prioritizing all this stuff is really, 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 you know, it's a bit like playing Tetris um, after you've had wine. Um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, which actually sounds like describing my whole life. <laughs> but it, it, it's, it's calculations and understanding it and then moving things around and not trying to get everything um, right, but just trying to make good decisions and use your, use your judgment and, and be judicious about. Um, That's why you, I mean, the word curate, I guess, <laughs> fits here. Yeah. Right? yeah, I suppose yeah. curate's got an artistic as well as a, um, it, it's not really algorithmic, is it so much? But Right, right, right. Interesting. Yeah, it, it can really mess with your head, all this stuff. Um, yeah, that's great. Especially, especially that U-shaped team that we've got in front there. It's so obvious that when you get a U-shaped team, it just hums and you just look and you go, whoosh. Um, but it doesn't look nearly as busy or hectic or stressful um, or productive as one that's actually all clogged up um, uh, with, with work. And if you come at it with blind eye, uh, with, with just with, with no sense of this stuff, um, you're going to fall for the, 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 you know, you're going to hear all those bees buzzing and you think, oh, it's all busy. Um, but when you realize that um, they're all just being busy and they're not actually off um, getting honey, they're all chasing, I don't know, I, my, my analogy's um, gone to the, the, the wrong way there. I'll stop on that one. But yeah, it, it's quite, it, it's hard work, but it's just, it, there's just a few insights. Um, one is the espresso. Hey, look, there's, there's espresso there. Wow, that's interesting. Maybe. 20% of the product gives me 80% of the value. Just maybe it does. Um, there's the, the snowball effect for the, for the profits. That's, I remember whenever I presented that, people come up to me after and go, wow, that's so obvious now that I can see it. Um, and then I think by the time I've, I've finished, they, they forget it and they go back to their real world because it's not part of their job. And, and the, the presence of bottlenecks, it's um, once you know they're there, you can often look and, you, and, and sometimes some situations you can see them and that's brilliant. And a lot of situations um, that they're hidden. And um, when I wrote, where is it? Whatever that, the bottleneck book. When I wrote this, I was going to call it bottlenecks of bastards um, <laughs> because, um, but they're not when you're managing them, but they're bastards because they're really, really, really good at hiding. Um, and, 
um they 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 create work that that um and it's it's like if you think of the bottle detective idea it's like they um try and frame all the other resources and make them look like they're bottlenecks and then they sit back evil little um bottleneck bastards um planning evil to slow everyone down um maybe you know, that re reminded me of a question i know you're i know you're kind of trying to take us in for landing here but can i ask another question <laughs> yeah go for it <laughs> um I, I've seen several times, like in small businesses, especially like with the CEO or sometimes like the COO or so, someone like in a role like that is usually like they can often be a bottleneck themselves, right? They're so busy all the time and they're, 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 their attention is being demanded all over the place. And I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that Graham might have seen this too with all of his consulting work, but I'm just wondering if like, can you speak, how do you, how do you change that? Because that, I mean, according to your model, that person should be like the one who's got the most extra capacity, right? Yeah, they should um, be. So how and do you flip the exact that? Opposite? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's typically the exact opposite. So how do you flip that? With difficulty, I'm just going to just pop in here in the chat. Oh, hang on. Give me one moment here. So um, there's just a picture of bottle. The, the, the defining characteristic of most bottles is that the, the bottleneck's actually the top. And, and I know that's just a silly analogy, but I think it's true in most, most organizations. Um, and, but when we look at things, so if you look at like that on the screen there, you've got the U-shaped um, team there. And then I went through and I, oh, hang on, it's on this one here. And then I put those guys on there. Um, you might be describing, say, the CEO there. Um, this is really, really, really common. Quite, quite often you find you, you find that those people that get to that level, if you get them to do their strengths finder, and I've done this a few times with people like that, you'll find that they have incredible tenacity, um, incredible energy, and they just keep working and working and working. Um, and it's like that book, you know, what got them there? Um, won't take them to the next level and they get to a point where they've set stuff up and it, it's true for small businesses it's true for big businesses and everything's kind of gone through them and then they have to get to a level where they figure out how to go and, and delegate to everyone but they can't go until they've delegated to everyone and they almost can't delegate to everyone until they've gone and so you got stuck with this. You imagine a person like a big ball of, um, you know, like two fishing lines that have been caught and tangled up and you have to slowly untangle them bit by bit. And if you look at the, um, the, the, the ATM, the thrive model that's there, um, if I go back in the quiet change thing there, that's mostly what that's about. It is picking the battle and, and it's really hard because you're going, um, it, you know, one in 10 situations, say, you look and go, wow, um, the person who has to cause the change to the bottleneck is the bottleneck. And so you need to help them, you know, figure out how to pick their battles. You have to pick their battles with them. You have to build trust with them. Um, you have to get them to do things that are really counterintuitive. Um, and, and often it's hard for them to, like, delegate because they don't um, have the... That, that, you know, learning to delegate is actually learning to trust. Um, they've got to cause change and, and they've thought through every single situation um, and they want other people to change, but they don't necessarily want to change themselves. Not that they don't recognize that they need to. It's just that it's so hard. And, and that's probably the difference between, say, the factory situation, you know, that you read about in, say, the goal. You look at it, you go, ah, oh. so in the goal, you got Alex and other people, and they come in and they look and they go, oh, I can see bottlenecks now. Holy crap, there's our bottleneck. Let's figure out what to do. And we'll go off to a meeting room and we'll whiteboard some stuff and figure it out. It's different when the person is that's the bottleneck is also the person that's got to go into the white um, and, and whiteboard with themselves. So that's not very helpful. I'm just saying it's really hard, but it's incredibly valuable when you do. And the, the key to doing it is pick your battles. Don't try and make them not the bottleneck uh, on day one. Just do it little bit by little bit. Um, build trust with them so that um, and do little changes um, that are really scalpel-like precision, um, as opposed to the loud, uh, 
uh, shotgun, scattergun kind of approach, just little changes so that, that don't provoke resistance from them and, and make them kind of push back. I wish it was easy. <laughs> that, was, that was great, really helpful. Thank you. You're very welcome.